generous, but as a congregation, we give 22% of our budget uh, to missions. And so uh, that means every time you drop a dollar in the offering box, 22 cents goes uh, outside of Calvary to bless people, sometimes here in Lake Havasu City in our community, sometimes uh, it's people in our state, sometimes it's people on the other side of the world. And, uh, and I just praise God for a church that is that generous. So last year, your generosity meant that we uh, gave over $500,000 away to mission causes around the world. Isn't that cool? And, uh, and I, think, I think that's one of the reasons that God keeps blessing Calvary is because we keep embracing generosity. It's just amazing how he does that. But the, the largest chunk of that money, over $200,000, goes to uh, 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 the cooperative program of Southern Baptist where uh, we take the money and pool it with about 45,000 other churches. And through that, we support uh, six seminaries, uh, uh, thousands of missionaries in the United States, North America, and about 4,000 international missionaries. And uh, some of those missionaries are the ones that we work with, like the group that just went to Kenya. We worked with missionaries that we support as a church and as a convention, uh, uh, you know, and we help take care of their kids and do that kind of stuff. And the, the missionaries that actually invited us, missionaries that I've taught with, I think you might have seen my picture up there, uh, you know, didn't look all that great in sporting the uh, Mozambican uh, outfit, but uh, is John and Vonnie Dinah. And John Dinah is with us uh, and his wife, Vani, uh, this weekend, and he's going to be sharing in the service. And I just want you to know that, that John has been in Mozambique, John and Vani have been in Mozambique for 25 years, serving God, leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and he does it, uh, and by the way, he's, he's somebody who's like, you know, hunted uh, hippos and crocodiles. Uh, he's somebody who uh, rides a, a motorcycle all over the place. He's somebody who can weld and who can do all kinds of stuff, build wells, uh, but most of all, his passion is introducing people to Jesus as Savior. And I've seen that, and uh, we're going to be going back there. And by the way, if you've been uh, helping uh, us support them in doing wells in Mozambique, this is the guy who's doing the wells. And so far, he told me today that Calvary, uh, through the gifts that you have given, we have, they have installed 31 wells in Mozambique. Isn't that amazing? So here's the deal. I want you to listen to him because uh, he's a friend. He's somebody who loves Jesus. He's somebody that God's been using for years, decades, to make a difference in uh, a country that's one of the poorest in the world. So if you guys would welcome and listen to John Dinah. John, where are you? You're supposed to be out of here by now. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Scott. Hello, Calvary Baptist Church. Hello. What an honor it is to be here and to share with you. Although the surroundings are a little different than the last place that I was preaching, and the language is different, and the songs are different, and the temperature is different, and the smells are different, but the name of Jesus is the same, and the power of God is the same. Isn't that right? Wherever you go in the world, it does not matter. God exists. God is there. Wherever you go in the world, God is present. When Chad asked if I would share with you, it was a great opportunity, a great delight, and first and foremost, I just want to say, praise be to the name of Jesus. All glory be to God. God has changed my life, and it's my greatest privilege to share that with people. And I believe when a person hears the good news of Jesus, that he died for our sins, took our debt, went into a grave to pay for that, and then rose again to show power over death. That's the greatest message ever told. Praise God. That is just an amazing thing to know, whether you're a child, whether you're an adult, whether you have a really checkered history of colorful craziness in your life, or whether you've been a good guy all your life that God would love us to that extent and so much and reveal his power in such a way it brings us together. So whatever our race, gender, age, history, we have a purpose together as God's church. Isn't that right? Does this church say amen? Is that okay? Can you do that here? Does Chad permit that? Okay. All right. So if you have your Bible with you, please 
I don't know, turn it on? I don't know. Today it's, I'm, I'm learning to turn on your Bible, I guess. Um, or I use an old Bible. Uh, I was given this at graduation from uh, Grand Canyon College. Chad and I graduated the same class. We didn't know each other, but we went to school together. And, um, and so I use this very same English Bible because I don't use English much where we live. We live in Mozambique, so we speak Portuguese, and I also speak Chwabo. So, quem está aqui que fala espanhol pode ouvir português um pouco, right? If you, if you speak some Spanish, you'll hear Portuguese a little bit. Mas banho o logo Chwabo oco no meu cardizio, papá. This is now one of our African languages that says, I really doubt there's somebody here who speaks this language. <laughs> okay. Languages, you know, they're, they're a big deal, but really it's the message. I thought about Calvary. What do you share at a church like this? Wow. Arizona, I'm a native of Arizona. I went to Central High School, Simus, grade school. Um, you know, this amazing lake and the river coming through it. And so I thought about, let me pick a passage that has something with a lake. God really laid this on my heart. So please look with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. As you're turning or <laughs> texting there, I don't know, uh, as you're getting there, just think of this day. Jesus is starting his ministry. Jesus is really initiating. He's chosen the 12 apostles to go with him. His family has come up in the day and said, you know, you, you really need to come and talk to us. And Jesus did not see them. And then the Pharisees were saying, well, you know, and he's got some issues and they're trying to distract from him. So there's all of these things that were going on in Jesus' life. And Jesus there, the crowds pressing on him. Chad said, do you need a stool? I said, really, what I could use is a boat, you know? Because the Bible says in, in chapter 4 that the crowds were pressing on him so much that he got into a boat, everybody on the banks, and Jesus just spent the day there telling them, teaching them, sharing the word of God with them. And as he was doing that, people were just hearing God's word. And it must have been an amazing opportunity to be there in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, hearing him share his word. The parable of the sower. The four seeds, you know the, the four soils that he went out and the sower went out and there's the seed on the road and there's a seed on the rocks and there's a seed that gets into the thorn bushes and, and yet there's the good ground. You, the lamp should never be covered. That a light that is covered to create and then to cover up makes absolutely no sense. Jesus is not talking about lights, of course. He's talking about your life. Parable of the seed that grows by God's power. We really don't know how it happens. You hear the gospel. You hear God's word. And only God brings the growth. You sleep. You go out. Now, Jesus was using this in agricultural terms. But we sow the seed to everybody. There is nobody that God has given you the right to say, they don't deserve to hear the gospel. They will not accept the Lord Jesus. We don't know, just as a farmer sows seeds in that way. And then, of course, the parable of the mustard seed. The parable of the mustard seed being so small, and yet it builds and it grows and it branches out. Even the birds have a nest in it. And here Jesus then says, be careful, pay attention to what I'm telling you. And all of this brings us to our focal passage. But what a delight it would be to sit on the banks of the lake and spend the day hearing Jesus. I mean, that was the first daycare, you know? The little kids were over here and the bigger kids were over here and everyone had their place. Jesus just talking and sharing with them. But then as we come to the end of that, verse 35 of chapter 4 begins and it says, And on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Now that's a long day. And now the evening comes, sun's going down, and he wants to go to the other side of the lake. It's about eight miles. And leaving the multitude, they took him along with them, just as he was, in the boat, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that 
the boat was already filling up, and he himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? And they became very much afraid. Some versions say terrified. And said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And then they went on over to the other side. What an amazing passage of Scripture. Now, one of the perplexing things of this passage to me forever was how can anyone sleep as the boat is sinking, right? And then I just, my own, ver- my own take on that is, well, that's why, <laughs> that's why they put it in there. I mean, that's why it's there, because it was astounding. It was amazing that that could happen. You have a day with Jesus, and then all of a sudden, you got trouble. You know, I just want to share quickly three observations of this passage to help. Three things that stand out to me. I think they're important. I think they're important for any believer. They're valuable lessons to learn on the lake with Jesus. First lesson is, just because God leads you to a task does not mean that it will be easy. I will tell you that missions is not easy. I will tell you that ministry is not easy in Lake Havasu, Arizona. There is no place that holiness is easy. There is no place, because of the effects of sin in the world, that being Christ-like is easy. It is not easy to live for God. It is not easy to surrender to him. In fact, we are called to a life of faith. Now, if you think about that, Abraham was called to a land which he knew not of. Just go. You don't know your destination. That's a high calling. Many times God calls us into ministry, and when we do, we think we have like uh, an American Express gold card. Okay? God called me to do this. He's going to open every door for me. He's going to open every opportunity for me. But just a brief glimpse at Mark 4 shows Jesus says, let's go to the other side. They get into the boat. In fact, it says they took him just as he was. Jesus, from all that day teaching, didn't even go back. They didn't get provisions. They didn't get anything. They took him as he was. And as they start going across into that lake, if you'll notice the passage, there's about four or five or six or eight boats with them, okay? There's other boats along. They said, yeah, this will be great. We'll go too. Yeah, they're with the crowd. They're on the banks. It's wonderful. But as they start to go, it's evening. And so as they start getting across that lake, it's getting dark. And as it gets dark, Jesus crashes in the back of the boat. He goes to sleep. And as he goes to sleep, then comes a storm. Now, hey, this has got to be a room full of fishermen and guys who have stories, okay? Uh, I don't know the history of Lake Havasu. I know the history of the Indian Ocean. I know places that I've been on that water that is scary. I live on the ocean, okay? I cross, I do. We put our motorcycle on that. I cross in dugout canoes, cross in little boats. I have seen every array of different things where I've wondered how how we're going to do. Now, I'm a good swimmer, and I don't really go into panic, but... But it's not unusual for people to die by drowning where I live, okay? Besides that, we get about a meter and a half of rainfall a year, and rice is the biggest crop around where I live, okay? And I have about four or five palm trees in my front yard, coconut trees. So if you come to my house, we'll go up, we'll get you a coconut. It's the real deal, okay? You know, as Jesus is going across and that crowd and being with all of the multitude and people gathered together and just enthralled with his teaching, but when he said, let's go to the other side, all of a sudden, the crowd narrowed down. Now there's other boats going with you, and then it gets dark, and then the storm starts, and then there you are. Never think that doing ministry in the dark, alone, in a storm, will be easy. 
Now, I know that David Johnson has been here, Pastor Johnson. Um, you know, David's son was living with, uh, with us when he had his accident and lost his life in Mozambique. He was staying in our home. He was coming back from preaching the gospel. He was writing and talking to his Mozambican friend. In fact, you don't know it, but you just saw him. He was on some of the pictures that you saw who was a passenger with Jeremiah on the motorcycle that day. And as they were riding back, car coming this way, they just, it's a one-lane road, they just went to the side, and as they were coming back, they had a fall, and Jeremiah lost his life that day. Gave his life for preaching the gospel. I don't understand that. I don't understand that to this day. He was staying with us. I allowed him to come. And then to see that, to close his eyes, for him to go back. Ministry does not mean it's going to be easy. In fact, it's going to be terribly hard. This year, I was visiting with one of our missionaries, Jim Otter. Jim Otter and Susan lived in, in Phoenix. They built a beautiful home on the north side of the valley off of Carefree Highway. Okay, Doesn't everyone want to you know, have a name like that? Carefree Highway, they got their house. They sold their house, they sold their business, and moved to Mozambique. They're still there. Turned the world upside down. And as I was with Jim, we went to go visit his pastor because his pastor's wife was sick with cancer. And so we went. I wanted to pray for his pastor and be with them and just listen. We were there for a couple of hours with him. And as we came home from that visit, the pastor called and he said, I just got word that my wife has died. Well, we got in the car, man, ran right back there. He, his wife was at her family's house about two hours away because the kids needed to come back to go to school. And so Jim and I gathered him and his son and his daughter, and we got in the car and we started that drive. It was evening. It was late. It was too late to go, but there was no other choice. And so we were driving back to take Pastor Acasio and his children to now where their mother and his wife had died. As we were driving, I got a text, and it's where one of our missionary colleagues had had an accident, and she had died. And I was just driving in the car. I didn't say anything, of course, to the pastor behind, but a friend of ours who had stayed with us in our house, Kathy Arnett, had an accident going to teach the scriptures with her husband, and she died. We took that pastor and his two children to the house, a very solemn time. We got back in the car, started a late night drive back. It was about 10 p.m. now. We had a two-hour drive. And then I got another text that her husband had now died. And you think of sorrow upon sorrow. And all of these people wholeheartedly giving their life to Christ in deep ministry. Randy and Kathy Arnett. Pastor Ocasio's wife, Jeremiah Johnson, and you know a bunch of others. My dear friend, when God calls us into ministry, when he calls us to follow him, it might seem simple. I grew up, my father owned a restaurant supply business in Phoenix, Valley Restaurant Supply. I grew up building houses with him. I grew up doing whatever. We worked all the time. World War II vets do that. We ate Spam and we worked, okay? That was it. We had a lot of baloney too. And I, my dad used to think that ministers didn't work. You know, he, he was wrong. We work all the time because God demands it. He calls us to it. In fact, we actually don't knock off. There is no nine to five in the missionary life. People die all the time you respond. Hunger never is over. You respond. Need for water, the clarity of water. I was there with, with, with the pastor in, in the room, and we're just drinking water. So easy. There it is. But you saw pictures of where your church is helping to provide water. 31 wells, average that by about 750 people per well that drink from those. What's that number? Your church is helping with that. But I can tell you, as the guy working on those wells, it ain't easy. <laughs> In every one of those places, we preach the gospel. 
In every one of those places, we share Jesus. In fact, you'll see it written in the cement. God loves you. That's the message from this church. God uses storms in life to teach you about himself and to reveal his power. God is teaching you what is lacking in your life by those storms. Now let me tell you something. You don't pick the storm. You don't pick when the storm comes. You have no idea that the storm is coming. But God picks those times in his sovereignty. And he determines that for you. And our job in the storm is to believe. If you look at the words of Jesus, after all of this happens, Jesus says, why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? Haven't you seen everything that I've been doing already? Why can't you apply what you've seen me do in the past into this present situation? And that's the challenge. Oh God, what have you done for me lately? God is sovereign. He picks the times and he will bring out in your weakness areas that he wants to work on. God is sovereign. He will put you into scenarios that you cannot even imagine. I sat in your other church campus and just looked at a whiteboard of prayer requests. And as I looked at every one of those, I just thought, ay, that's so serious. That is so hard. And that's going on in your congregation all the time. God is not devoid of those prayer requests. God is working in those things, in those illnesses, through the death of God's saints. His word is proclaimed. Your faith is seen not in the good times, guys. It is seen in the crucible of difficulty. When faith is demanded, that is when it must be produced. So don't shrink back when it gets hard or it gets real. Now, I want to tell you, it is a little bit harder, I think, to live the Christian life in, along this road than it is in Mozambique. I will say that. Because the people I work with are generally subsistence farmers. And life is hard every day for a subsistence farmer. Water is hard when you carry every bucket you use. Food is hard when you grow everything that you eat. When you make less than a dollar a day, it brings a little bit of a different perspective on life. And so the difficulty of the Christian life is just taken in. Life's hard. But man, I just, I never saw so many recreational vehicles in my life, I don't think, except up this road. <laughs> There's a few of them out here, okay? So if the mentality is recreation or what, oh, it must be so hard when God says no, or God says give it away, or God says follow me. That's all he said to Matthew, follow me, and his life was changed. And so God will use the storms of life to reveal himself. And God's church and God's love and God's power and God's people are best revealed in the worst of circumstances. I went to Joburg, Johannesburg, South Africa this year. And um, as I was there, I was working with some guys in their inner city work. And we, I mean, you're talking, you're talking rough. Whatever it is, well, it's Phoenix, you know. It's whatever, These city, it's all the same, guys. It's, it's human nature. And we were looking at a situation, I mean, babies just coming and being born into, into nothing. And what did the church do? They gathered together and they built a plot with a home staffed by volunteers and they cut a wall into, or a hole into a wall that surrounded them into this inner city, very harsh area so that there's an alternative for a child that is born into a, a terrible circumstance. So many children, I'm sorry to say, wind up in trash heaps. And the church looked at that and said, we can't, that can't be. And they put a wall, they put a home, they brought in volunteers from there, all diversity of, of churches. And when I looked at that wall and I looked at that door, and I think of a child, we saw the dedication of this beautiful child. 
and what it must be like, the future of that child, to go into a metal bin and a light come on, a buzzer go off, and when that opens from the other side are the loving, caring hands of someone who said, I care. Because God cared for me. I will care for the hopeless and the helpless, not about money, about care that the love of God will constrain us and that a church would respond in such a way. In the struggle, God reveals what's lacking in you and he reveals himself. And lastly, just know, Jesus wanted to go to the other side because God is not satisfied just with this crowd. God wants everybody. He wants everybody. Now, he wants you. God wants you. You're not any less special, okay? I know that we have to be special. You're not any less special. Christ died for every single one of us. But it means that God is also not satisfied with just the English-speaking crowd. And God is not satisfied with just the guys. And he's not satisfied with just the girls. He's not satisfied with just the Hispanic. He's not satisfied with just the Italian. He's not satisfied with just the young or the old or the medium. And you can just go on and on and on. But if you think of this city, Havasu, how many segments of population must exist here? How many segments of that population do you run into? Do you have encounters with? How many segments do you not run into, but we need to target? Because God is taking people to the other side. Folks, I will just conclude this evening with this question. Who are you? And as you look over this lake, this beautiful lake, where do you spend your time? Are you on the edge? Are you an edge person? I mean, worship and into it and going and it's wonderful and I mean, it feeds you and, it, and, and it's so wonderful. That's great. There's no guilt trip. There's no, I'm not, I don't have a guilt thing at the end of that statement, by the way. It's okay to be an edge person. Your volunteers left here and spent, what, two and a half weeks with us in Kenya so that our missionaries could have an edge time and worship and be together and hear God's word. Edge is good. It's good to hear God's word and consider and be challenged by his word. But also there's times when God calls us to the middle. Not of your choosing. And that God will lay into your life a challenge that will reveal your areas of weakness and reveal his power. And that only those disciples, when they ran out of ability to row, when they could not handle it anymore, when they thought Jesus, you know, asleep on the cushion doesn't even care. You know what? He cares. But just because he doesn't act like you think he should act doesn't mean he doesn't know or he doesn't care. God is sovereign. Man has many plans, but God's purposes are eternal, and he's working those purposes. And you might be a middle person, but there also might be somebody that God's calling in this room to go to the other side, to get another language, to get into another culture, to pour your life out into people who do not look like you, but as you minister and invest and pour yourself into them, God will use you. You can be used, literally, to change the world if God has called you to it. So it's not about you, you might have to leave the bank. You might have to leave the congregation. But if that is what God has put into your heart, you say yes to him, you trust him, so that God himself will be glorified. I'll just say this. The disciples were afraid of that storm. But when Jesus stood up and spoke to the wind and spoke directly to the waves and said, Hush, be still. Be muzzled. That's what it means in Greek. Be muzzled. They were terrified of him. That's a good word. They became more afraid of who was in the boat with them than they were of those outside circumstances when they saw his power. 
May God be glorified to the ministry of this wonderful church. Thank you for what you're doing in Mozambique. You're supporting us. You are building so many wells in Mozambique. You are providing all kinds of opportunities. Your people have come and spent a couple of weeks with us in Kenya in what was really a sardine can sized place and not one word of complaint did I hear from your volunteers. In fact, a couple of those young missionary men were complaining to me. I said, you need to be a spiritual of those volunteers. They came here and they're serving with a smile. You need to be like that. Let me tell you, way to go, Calvary. Thanks for representing. I look, oh, okay. Yeah. I would like to lead us in a closing word of prayer and just thank God for this time of worship together.